Today I'm going to be talking about uh, Fort Marcy, the Fort Marcy Military Reservation. I first gave this talk in Williamsburg, Virginia, and it's been given all over the country at various times in my career. Uh, but the, the most common version of it that you see nowadays is this version, which is that sink of vice and extravagance, uh, which was um, created for the Three Trails Conference in Santa Fe back in 2015. So I'm going to give a modified version of, of what, I, what I presented at the Three Trails Conference uh, about five years ago now. It sounds horrible, but because this is coming from a place where I, I've given this talk over many different portions of the country, the first thing I have to do is introduce Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, I would hope most people that are watching this today, though we are going to be on the internet, so um, maybe not. Most people, at least in the live recording of this today, probably know where Santa Fe, New Mexico is. It's um, located in north central New Mexico. It was officially established in 1610 by Governor Peralta, um, though it, it, it there's a debate. It may be as early as 1607 or 1608 when the via was, was actually unofficially established. Um, and of course, that via, well, we, we give a date of 1608. It was built upon an earlier uh, Tewa Pueblo known as Ogapoge or White Shell Water Place. So this has been a place people had been living at for, for hundreds of years at the time the Spanish came into it. Um, it served as the administrative capital of New Mexico during most of the Spanish colonial Mexican American territorial New Mexico statehood periods. Mo I say most because there are a few exceptions at different times uh, when it wasn't really the state uh, capital or the, the capital of the um, administration. But it's also, um, and, and this had to do with the Three Trails Conference, it's the confluence of three major historic trade routes. And those are, of course, the El Camino Real de Tierra Adentro the old Spanish trail. So the El Camino Real went down to Mexico City, the old Spanish trail, uh, which um, went out to California. And of course, the Santa Fe Trail, which connected Santa Fe to points further east in Missouri and into the broader eastern United States. Now, the work that I'm, I'm talking about today is, is primarily centered on a place known that is today the Santa Fe Convention Center. It was built in 2008 and encompasses about 72,000 square feet of area in downtown Santa Fe. It's located just north of the plaza at the intersection of Grant Avenue and Marcy Street within the former Fort Marcy Military Reservation. So it's, it's just north of the plaza. You've probably been there, or if you haven't, it's right next to City Hall in the large post office. Um, and it had been the place, you know, where Fort Marcy had, had begun. And of course, with Fort Marcy's story and this story today that I'm going to tell, it really starts with the, the, the Mexican-American War. Um, the Mexican, you know, the, the Mexican-American War was a war between Mexico and the United States. And it began in 1846 as a border dispute. Um, it ended, though, um, you know, even though it has humble beginnings, it ended with the annexation of pretty much the northern half of Mexico under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So it lasts for only about two years in a huge chunk of Mexico. It's carved away and made United States territory. In New Mexico, this is often referred to, the, the conquest of Santa Fe is, is sometimes referred to as the uh, bloodless conquest. It was headed by the Army of the West, which was established in Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, uh, under the command of General Stephen Watts Kearney. He had at his disposal about 300 dragoons. Dragoons are um, men who, who ride on horseback to the battle, but ostensibly they're, they're, they're supposed to get off the horse to actually fight. So they're mounted infantry as opposed to true cavalry. That's sort of true in United States history. The, the, the problem you get into with any sort of dragoons in military history is as soon as you give a soldier a horse, he doesn't want to get down off the horse. Um, so dragoons are, are, are a type of cavalry, I guess is a better way. But it also included 500 Mormons. Um, the, the, the Mormons actually signed up for military service to help pay for the Mormon trek out to Utah and about a thousand Missouri volunteers. So the army consisted of about 1,800 um, United States men, um, and only 300 of those were actually professional soldiers. The rest were volunteers, um, either enlisted to, uh, to get money for the Mormon cause, or just general people in Missouri um, that had ties to New Mexico and volunteered for the conquest. 
uh, a timeline as far as uh, this lecture goes. They left on the 27th of June. They reached Las Vegas, New Mexico on August 15th, and they reached Santa Fe by August 8th without firing a shot. And by August 24th, so a little, about two months into their campaign, they begin work on a, a, a military fort known as Fort Marcy. It, 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 the, the success of the bloodless conquest of Santa Fe uh, is often looked at as a, a success of the US government through propaganda. In fact, uh, Kearney, wherever he could, would make these, these uh, speeches to the residents of New Mexico. Um, and this is one he gave in Las Vegas on August 15th. He said, from the Mexican government, you never receive protection. The Apaches and Navajos come down from the mountains and carry off your sheep and even your women whenever they please. My government will correct all of this. It will keep off the Indians. So he's selling the idea that the U.S. Army is coming to protect the residents of New Mexico um, from depredations, primarily from the Apaches and the Navajos. Um, there, there's also the potential, though this is not recorded very well in the archival record, it certainly the New Mexico residents at least initially thought about uh, attacking the U.S. Army, but if possible, they, the, governor, uh, the, 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 the governor of New Mexico at the time actually told them to go home and put away their weapons. Um, this may be because it, some, some people who take a very anglified view of history tend to think, well, they would have gotten slaughtered by the U.S. Army had they resisted, and he was just trying to protect his people. It's also possible that he, he took a large bribe from the U.S. government to uh, not resist. Um, in, in other cases, such in the case of California during the Mexican-American War, we see very clearly that the, the, the Mexican forces were, were clearly able, even if if, if um, perhaps not having the, the technological sophistication of the U.S. Army at the time, were, were more than capable of, of defeating the U.S. Army in battle. Uh, but, but he did that. He said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to um, you know, protect you from the, the Native Americans. And to do that, we're going to establish a military post. At least this is what he's saying publicly at the time. And so they establish, um, you know, within a week, of arriving in Santa Fe, they've established a military post. Now, mind you, the war is going to go on for uh, uh, almost another year and a half. So this is very early on. It kind of shows that the Americans were coming as colonizers, not necessarily as people interested in settling a border dispute. They, 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 well, they did want to settle a border dispute, but they wanted to, to move their border way south of where it originally was. Uh, at, at the point of the Mexican-American War, the border was actually in, 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 in present day Colorado. Um, but they established Fort Marcy. They named it after uh, Secretary of War, William Marcy. And it was the headquarters of the ninth military department. They actually started um, doing the fort by, by reoccupying the dilapidated Presidio buildings in construction of a star fort and blockhouse overlooking the town. Now, interestingly, this photo here, which shows a white picket fence and is obviously much later, shows one of the only Spanish Presidio buildings. Now it's heavily modified at this point, but this was the old Spanish Presidio barracks, which the US Army turned into a hospital. So if you removed the white picket fence, you removed all the uh, brick um, chimneys that you see there, um, and, and probably took out about half the windows, you had the original Spanish barrack, barracks of the, the Presidio in Santa Fe. Um, so what did this look like? Well, you can kind of see here, um, this is a map, uh, a, a plan of Fort Marcy in the plaza in 1847. It's actually a, a slightly modified version. But what you can see here, you have the palace of the governors kind of in the, the lower, um, the, the plaza in the, the lower left-hand side of the slide, the palace of the governors. And then all those buildings to the north of the palace, including the palace, were the old Spanish Presidio. So all those buildings were occupied. In fact, that square building I showed in the, the last slide is that one labeled hospital on the far left side, that big square. But then you can see up on the hill, you can see the star fort kind of overlooking the town and a square structure kind of off from the star fort, uh, which is a blockhouse. Um, now, if you ask yourself, why are they building these things? You know, the, the, the Spanish Presidio never had a star fort or a blockhouse. The Navajo and Apache don't attack in large army waves. Um, you know, the, the, there's no reason to have a star fort or a blockhouse protecting Santa Fe. 
Well, that's because they really weren't interested in protecting the Santa Fe residents from the Native Americans. Private, com uh, not private, government correspondence at the time suggested the real reason why they were building the Star Fort and Blockhouse. It was built in case of extremities. From the fort, every house within Santa Fe could be leveled on the least appearance of revolt. So if the people of Santa Fe gave them any reason to suspect they were going to revolt, they planned to level Santa Fe entirely, destroy, dis destroy the settlement. Um, and, 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 and while we think, oh God, so they're telling them they're gonna protect them against the Native Americans and, and ultimately they're, they're, they're building this thing to oppress the people of Santa Fe. They absolutely were. But in all fairness to the military, their fears were realized with the Taos revolt in 1847. It didn't come from Santa Fe, but there was a rebellion against US rule almost immediately. It just didn't come from Santa Fe. Santa Fe was kept quiet by the fact that the Star Fort and Blockhouse were built. So when the Mexican-American War ends, New Mexico is a very different place than it is today. In fact, you can see the territory of New Mexico here as it existed in 1850, all the way up till 1861. It's much larger. It includes portions of places that you don't think. Um, in fact, most of the state was acquired in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but a little bit more was actually uh, purchased with the Gadsden Purchase in, in 1853. Um, but the, the territory, New Mexico territory in the 1850s included the present day states of Colorado, parts of the portions or the entirety of Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah mostly New Mexico and Arizona, but portions of, of Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, and, uh, well, not Oklahoma, I'm sorry, of, 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 of um, Nevada and Utah. Um, the, the, the portions that might have been part of Texas or Oklahoma are still open to some debates whether they were actually ever administered from New Mexico. Um, if you were to take a history lesson in Texas, um, which I know, um, sadly enough, there are world history books according to Texas, I'm sure they don't mention the fact that part of it was managed under New Mexico for a period of time. But all of this large territory, regardless of just exactly how big it is, I think we can look there and say, well, God, it was a pretty big blueprint, even if some of the borders were disputed. All of this was administered from Santa Fe and specifically from Fort Marcy. Um, it's also at this point a center for trade. You remember, it, it, it was the, the location, the center of three major trails by the 1850s, 1840s. It linked Santa Fe to Mexico. The El Camino Real did that. The Spanish Trail linked Santa Fe to Los Angeles. The, 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 the Santa Fe Trail linked Santa Fe to Independence, Missouri and points east. There, there was a lot of different connections. Santa Fe was kind of this nexus for all this different trade and control of the the American West or the American Southwest or the in, in northern Mexico, you know, it, it's this nexus of all these different trade networks kind of coming together. So it was really important. Fort Marcy was also a center of war. Um, uh, so in addition to trade, it was also the location from which numerous campaigns were conducted by the U.S. Army. I'm not going to talk about any of these campaigns in detail today. We're going to actually revisit. Um, the Navajo campaigns and the American Civil War in two subsequent lectures to this one. Um, but you also have the Taos Revolt in 1847, the, the, the Hickory and Mescalero punitive expeditions, you have the Red River War against the Comanche, and then of course you have the Spanish-American War. Well, well, you think, well, God, they, they weren't fighting Cuba, they weren't fighting in Cuba, you know, but they were. The soldiers mustered that fought in Cuba were mustered right there at Fort Marcy, at the pal right in front of the Palace of the Governors. They trained at Fort Marcy before they got on those boats to go out to Cuba. So, um, it, in fact, um, I don't put it in here, but by that same uh, notion that the, the Philippine insurrection could also be considered its own separate war. I don't include it on here, but it could be. The, the soldiers at Fort Marcy participated in that war as well. Um, now, Bosque Redondo is going to be... Um, uh, the, the conversation of a later talk, but I do want to mention it here because perhaps this shows some of the best examples of, of, of some of the policies that are coming from Fort Marcy during this time. Uh, the Bosque Redondo Indian Reservation uh, was established in November of 1862. It's located along the Pecos River and housed about 400 Mescalero Apache and 7,000 Navajo. 
um, who were forced to perform agricultural labor, labor in communal fields. And roughly about a quarter of those who were brought into Bosque Redondo Indian Reservation uh, died from disease and starvation. Uh, the Mescalera fled in 1865, and the Navajo were allowed to leave in 1968, with the, the site being closed in 1869. I provide here a, a definition. This is a definition of a concentration camp. According to Google, it's a place where large numbers of people, especially political prisoners or members of persecuted minorities, are deliberately imprisoned in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities, sometimes to provide forced labor or to await mass execution. By this definition, Bosque Redondo and the, 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 the instruments that, that the people at Fort Marcy certainly could be accused that Bosque Redondo was a concentration camp for Native Americans. And I don't say that lightly. Um, I, I know that certainly with, with red power movements of, of the, the late 60s and early 70s, perhaps every, um, and, and I'm not faulting this in any way, every Native American reservation could be considered a concentration camp of one form or another. Uh, however, in this case, I think the case for Bosque Redondo is better than, than most. Uh, people lived in truly atrocious um, living conditions, and, and as a result, many of them died. Uh, Fort Marcy was also the location of the Santa Fe Ring. Uh, the Santa Fe Ring, for those of you who don't know, was the um, a Republican coalition of attorneys, land speculators, and politicians that controlled Santa Fe. Uh, members of the coalition made money through government contracts and fraudulent land deals. Um, really what it was, was a way of uh, cheating the, the Hispanic citizens, the, 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 the peoples who had lived in New Mexico and had been residents of New Mexico prior to the U.S. invasion, out of their lands. It was the division and consolidation of land, Spanish land grants. Uh, and it, it really ended with uh, the, the Santa Fe Ring uh, had two big episodes of violence, uh, the first being the Colfax County War and the latter being the Lincoln County War. Um, and accusations against the, the, the Santa Fe Ring and, of course, against Fort Marcy was utilization of African-American soldiers as a terror tactic against Democratic dissidents. Um, now, I know probably many of you hearing this today probably have very different views of what the Republican and Democratic parties are about today. But back in the day, just to be clear about this, you can almost reverse those names. Um, so it's it, uh, the, the, the progressive party, as it were, were the Republicans and the conservative party were the Democrats during this, this time period. If you want to look in that kind of terminology, uh, most of the Democrats uh, were from the South, whereas most of the Republicans were from the North, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, in, in fact, one of the earliest Republicans was an ancestor of mine from Virginia. Um, he, he, he was not uh, an enlightened Republican by any stretch of the imagination, He, but that goes in a different direction. Um, a good example of this is the stationing of, of the 9th Cavalry at Fort Marcy. Uh, the 9th Cavalry is one of those Buffalo Soldier regiments. I get where the name comes from. The, the name actually comes from African-American hair, um, potentially, or supposedly the Plains Indians uh, perhaps saw the African-Americans, and I say perhaps, they use this loosely, as um, the reincarnated ancestors of the Buffalo. They slaughtered coming back to, to punish them. Um, but the... the the 9th Cavalry and other Buffalo Soldier African-American regiments operated throughout New Mexico Military District, which was administered by Fort Marcy and Santa Fe, uh, from about 1875 to 1881. Um, they were considered ideal Indian fighters, but also loyal to the Republican cause. I mean, it, it, it can't be stressed enough. Um, these are people who, many of these people viewed their, their emancipation, their freedom from slavery, as the result, and, and, and justifiably so, as the result of Republicans pushing uh, for the, the, the destruction of slavery and the destruction of the South. And therefore, they were utilized as bodyguards for the governor housed at the Palace of the Governors. In fact, here's the 9th Cavalry sitting outside the bandstand at the plaza. Um, and, and in fact, we have some great examples of how they were used uh, to uh, promote Republican interests in the territory. Uh, one such incidence was the use of African-American soldiers to arrest Clay Allison in March of 1876 on the pretense that as a former slave owner, if he saw African-Americans coming to arrest him, he would resist. 
and they would have all the right necessary to kill him on the spot. So rather than having to have to bring him up on charges that were at best, that they could just kill him outright, which would solve a whole bunch of problems for the Republican Party. Um, so the, the, these actions are, are, are not very good. In fact, um, the U.S. government was aware that Fort Marcy and the soldiers stationed in New Mexico were um, not doing good. In fact, um, Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Vo Sumner, uh, military governor of New Mexico in 1851, actually called the city of Santa Fe and Fort Marcy that sink of vice and extravagance. He actually used those words in, 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 in his um his uh, report to the United States government in 1851. Uh, it was, the corruption was so bad, he takes the entire military for a period of time and he moves them out to Fort Union, out on the plains, away from Santa Fe altogether. And then he can't stand it there. So then he, a year later, he moves the post to Albuquerque. And in his yearly report that year, he just suggests that, that the United States just abandoned New Mexico altogether. He thinks it's such a terrible place. Um, now, in, the, in fairness, the soldiers respected him so much that when they created their, their concentration camp at Bosque Redondo, they named the fort after this man. He hated the soldiers so much. Um, but ultimately, he, 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 he didn't get his way. It went right back to Fort Marcy, and Fort Marcy Military Reservation became the center of control again. Uh, in fact, it's important to note that when we talk about Fort Marcy, and I'm going to get into some archaeology in a minute, um, the division between military and civil authority remains vague. So if you look at this map I have in front of you, you'll see the plaza in the, the, the lower right. Uh, just north of it, you'll have the Palace of the Governors, uh, which, which, which was the housing of all, um, um, all government in New Mexico. It included the, the House and Senate chambers, included the governor's office, right across the street from it. So that building just to the left of it, is the department headquarters for the U.S. Army. And in, in some cases, ostensibly, these are separated by Lincoln Avenue, right? So Lincoln Avenue separates your, your, your military power from your, your, your uh, civil authority. However, during mo much of New Mexico's history, especially in times of like the Taos Revolt or the American Civil War, martial law was declared. So there really was no boundary whatsoever uh, between these two institutions. And even today, if we were to look at, at the blueprint of the Fort Marcy Military Reservation, well, while state government is still not housed, it is not housed in, in the reservation today, City Hall of Santa Fe, so municipal authority, is still housed within the Fort Marcy Military Reservation even today. Uh, it's actually about where those stables are, uh, kind of the northeast part of that slide. In fact, the thing you see at the very north, where you see it says Federal Street, that was the old racetrack. That, that federal building was supposed to become the new um, state government building, but it was never completely built. In fact, nowadays, it's a, it's co a federal courthouse. Um, okay, so archaeologists, so where do I come involved in this history? I've given you a brief rundown of some of the, the, the aspects of history at Fort Marcy and kind of what they were up to. Um, well, the archaeology for Fort Marcy really got going during the excavations for the new Santa Fe Convention Center, which is that structure I talked about at the beginning. Field work was between 2004 and 2008. And you can see a 20-something um, a Matt Barber in the pictures on your right-hand side. In fact, that was the first project that I shaved my head on. In fact, I'm standing there in that upper one with Steve Lentz. Uh, who was the project director. The principal investigators were Tim Maxwell and Stephen Post. I was still early in my career at that point. Um, I was promoted uh, right before the project to crew chief, and I, I crewed along with Candace Lewis and Susan Moga. Uh, Susan's still with the OAS today. Um, and, I, uh, and there's multiple components here. So the convention center didn't just have Fort Marcy. It had a Native American village. It had a Spanish hacienda on the property. It had a uh, Spanish and Mexican Presidio, and a U.S. Army post, and even a, a San, old Santa Fe High School um, had, had been on the property. So there's a lot of different levels there. In fact, if you look in the lower, I said there, there's a picture of a painted kiva here. Well, I'm not going to be able to show you pictures of a painted kiva if you know anything about Coronado and, and cultural sensitivity and how we don't show pictures of the painted kiva. That hole. So if you look at the destruction mess in me standing at the total station in the south the, the lower corner, lower uh, right corner of the slide, 
um, you'll see a hole kind of right behind me. What I'm actually working on there is documenting um, the, the one of the painted, well, the painted Kiva at Ogapogi, uh, which I had the opportunity to work on as well in the project. And unfortunately, that's all I'm going to say about Ogapogi and the painted Kiva uh, during this uh, lecture, uh, but, but an amazing time. Um, but my main focus on the project, and the reason I was brought onto the project was to, um, as a historical archaeologist, uh, was to work on the excavations at Fort Marcy. Um, and we worked on excavating the enlistments quarters, the non-commissioned officers quarters, the officers quarters, as well as all the outbuildings uh, associated with those structures. And that includes privies and wells and everything else that went into service in that building. So what you can see here on the left-hand side is you have a picture of the, the enlistments quarters right here. And then down below, you can see us excavating the enlistments quarters. In fact, you can see me, I'm pointing at something and, or I'm yelling at Henry while he's got a shovel in his hand. Rick looks looking back at me. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Henry Etsidi, who's the, um, the figure in the black shirt, and then the further back blue shirt, Vernon Foster, they're both um, uh, Navajo tribal members from Tohatchi. Um, that we are working on the, the project. It led to the recovery. We had over 70,000 artifacts associated with Fort Marcy collected as part of this, this, this larger project for the convention center. Uh, these are some of the privies. In fact, I, I give an entirely different talk called Sanitation in the City, different where I talk about uh, the beauty and, and miraculousness of the construction of outhouses during how that evolved in the, the 19th century and early 20th century in New Mexico. But here you have a couple examples of wells, uh, cesspits, and privies. Uh, you'll notice the architecture for some of those uh, is pretty amazing. The amount of stonework that went into um, the, the, the one you're seeing there. Uh, in the kind of lower left and in the center are the walls to the enlisted men's um, um, cesspit or, or outhouse privies. Uh, they're, 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 they're straight line, oh no, not straight line cesspits. They, these are actual privies. We poop right on top of it. In fact, it has, um, this is a scientific word, so nobody steal my scientific word. There's poop shoots for the privy or urinal shoots. In fact, you'll see on the stonework in the, the lower left, they have these kind of like stone uh, areas where it kind of slides down at an angle so the poop and pee could slide down into the, the, the bottom. Uh, pretty gross. Um, uh, pretty amazing stuff too though. Um, what, what we get out of all this, what we, we started doing these excavations, mostly of the privies and, and cesspits, is we, we really saw an abundance of, of um, uh, trade goods found as a result of the excavations. Here we have the soldiers at Fort Marcy sitting down for, for Christmas dinner. I don't even remember what year this is. I want to say this is 1880. Um, but we found that the, the reason I use this photo is the dish set that's in the front, um, we found that it, almost that entire dish set that, that you can see where they're, they're getting served up. They had a decoration that showed which unit was actually eating off the plates. What, what you saw with Fort Marcy is, first of all, there was an abundance of non-local materials, products. Um, you know, wage-based jobs offered a means to purchase, and the location, both economically and politically, afforded them access to anything they fancy. Remember, they're they're the center, they're the, the center of political and military power in the territory, but they're also at the center of all these different trade networks coming in from California, coming in from Mexico, coming in from the U Eastern United States. They can buy. We found, and they could buy anything they wanted. They they they. Uh, if, if they could get their hands on anything. So uh, compared to most um, military posts on the, the, the American frontier where, where supplies were limited, these guys actually lived, you know, when you were able to be in Santa Fe, you lived a pretty swank lifestyle. And, 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 and the surprise comes not that they could buy lots of different things, but what they actually chose to spend their money on. And this is probably where this, this talk really takes a turn for the worst, uh, as opposed to just concentration camps and, and, and terror, political terror tactics. They chose to buy only a couple different goods. And the, the primary one of those was alcohol. Um, well, U.S. Army policies in, in most military posts forbade its consumption. It was endemic throughout the ranks and across military installations. However, it becomes far worse at Fort Marcy because it has access to so many different things. It's located within a, a larger city. Um, in fact, 
it was by far and away alcohol products, alcohol bottles were the most abundant non-locally produced item found on the Fort Marx II military reservation. Uh, they were primarily encountered in the post privies where they could be, you know, the drink could be consumed privately. Um, and it's, it's not just to be clear, it's not just whiskey and beer bottles, but also a large number of patent medicines, which at, at that point, patent medicine was another code for something that had a large amount of alcohol. Um, in, in fact, you, you get a whole bunch of different examples of that. And I think I've got an example on the next page. This is an example of, of one of the alcohols they, they chose, alcoholic beverages or possible alcoholic beverages they chose to drink. We don't know if this one actually contained alcohol, but I like it because it's a funny example. This is a Hanyadi Janos bottle. So Hanyadi Janos, um, th th this, this, this pat medicine was produced by Andreas Slaxinger of Budapest, Hungary. Um, and it's actually named after a folk, a Hungarian folk hero. Uh, uh, Janos, um, Hanyadi, J John Hanyadi, Janos just means John in, in Hungarian, um, actually drove the Turks out of um, Hungary for a period of time in the 15th century. He was a great national hero, saved the country. Interestingly enough, this, this product, which is named after this great national hero driving the Turks out of Hungary, um, was a cure for liver problems. It was known to drive the bad things out of your intestines and cure, of all things, piles, better known today as hemorrhoids. So just like Hanyadi drove the Turks out of, um, out of Hungary, this bottle of Hanyadi Janos will drive the, the, the hemorrhoids off your buttocks. And it likely contained a large dose of alcohol. Now, I, I'm sorry for the, 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 the idea that they link uh, piles or hemorrhoids with Turks. What made the Hungarians do that in the 19th century, I think is probably to do with the fact that the Ottoman Empire was in, in, in clear decline at that point. And they could get away with those um, kind of terrible associations, but um, good idea as to why it may have contained a lot of alcohol. Though in this case, we don't know if Hanyadi Janos had alcohol in it or not. You see it as a dark green bottle. Um, what this does is the, the, before you have um, uh, darker colored brown and dark green bottles could actually uh, uh, prevent or um, slow a uh, photo degradation of, of alcohol. So it, it kept alcohol before becoming skunky beer. Um, skunky beer is literally fo um, photo degradation, something along those lines. It's a scientific word. Um, and so this is just an example of um, alcohol bottles coming out of one of the privies. Now, if you ask yourself, what is that colorful stuff that's on the, the bottles there? That's human feces. Um, uh, and and, and the, the beauty of the, these privies, is, as far as my own research goes, is every building had its own privy. So the officers didn't use the outhouse the enlisted men used. And the enlisted men didn't use the same outhouse as the non-commissioned officers, which meant that when you excavated an outhouse, you knew, you may not know exactly who used it, but you can tell what their rank was in the U.S. Army. So we were able to cross compare if there were any differences across ranks of what people consumed, what people ate, what people chose. And, and perhaps not surprisingly, the officers chose to drink wine mostly. Enlisted men loved whiskey. Um, whiskey in the, the, the 19th century was the, 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 the drink of choice for most Americans. And the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers, um, liked beer. Uh, and that sounds weird at first until you realize that most of the NCOs were soldiers, um, you know, had, had previously served in Ireland or Germany. They were German or Irish, many of them were German and Irish immigrants. They were looking for careers in the U.S. Army, but couldn't rise to the rank of officers. And uh, we can see that those, those um, stereotypes of Germans and Irish preferring beer, um, it, in fact, those ethnicities would, would ultimately push America towards being, becoming a, a beer consuming nation right there in the, the 19th century. But that's not all we found, because that, that, that's not about, oh, they drank alcohol, well, boys will be boys, right? Um, we also found a large number of um, uh, Ferguson type syringes. Uh, most of these were found in the, the enlistment's quarters. Now, Ferguson type syringe, uh, it, the only thing you have preserved here, so the syringe looks slightly different than what you have here. It's actually wrapped in leather and has a, um, 
a brass or a copper tip. There's no demarcations for dosage. You literally put things into the syringe and you stick it in the arm and you push it in. And they're intended to be reused multiple times. So these are not things that you use once and discard. In fact, um, a genetic study um, from a, uh, a, a um, house of ill repute, I guess I'll use that word, um, in, in Virginia City, Nevada, in, in, around the same time as Fort Marcy, uh, found that, that needles were shared by, by a number of individuals. Maybe, uh, I, think, I think the average was 14. I might be, be over-exaggerating that, but say it was even seven or eight. So you might have seven or eight individuals at, at this brothel uh, sharing one needle. They could find genetic markers for, for eight different people using that same needle. Well, the same thing would have been going on here. So these needles would have been used repetitively and being used repetitively by multiple people. And, and they're commonly found, they, they are found in brothels and gambling halls. So if you don't find them in a medical context, um, the most likely place you're going to see them is brothels and gambling halls. But you say, wait, Fort Marcy did have a hospital. It totally did. In fact, this is the, the remodeled hospital. So after they got rid of the Spanish Presidio. Um, but they fa we found 49 syringes and one possible urethral irrigator. And they weren't associated with the hospital at all. Remember those privies? Only certain people had access to those privies. In fact, the funny thing is, considering, and, and this is the hospital doesn't have one, but most of the other buildings have white picket fences around them. So unless you wanted to hop a fence to go use the other person's outhouse, you wouldn't necessarily have access to that outhouse. Um, so the, the, it, the fact that most of these were found in the enlisted men's privy suggested a recreational use and covert discard. Um, and you say to yourself, really? They were drug addicts? It's, it's actually not that surprising. In fact, a lot of the, these are advertisements from the, the later half of the, the 19th century. Um, the, the, it was actually called soldier's disease. Um, it was the term used for, for morphine addiction following the Civil War. Um, uh, morphine, it, it, you know, was an opioid and it's a precursor to heroin. Um, some accounts allege um, that it was widespread in the 1860s with over 400,000 cases amongst U.S. soldiers in, in the, the 19th century. I think that's, I'm sure that's over-exaggerated. But certainly, I mean, if you go back to, well, we found 49 of them, right? Or we just rounded up to 50. And seven people used each syringe. Well, that's 350 people at the military post was occupied over a substantial period of time. But say that only represents uh, one to 5% of the total soldiers um, using uh, morphine at Fort Marcy. That's a lot of people. Moreover, that, that would be, if, if you said uh, one to 5% of the, the soldiers at Kirtland Air Force uh, Base had heroin addiction, that would be a problem. That would be something you needed to take care of. Um, and, and realistically, we don't get a lot. I mean, you, you didn't advertise necessarily um, morphine um, per se itself, uh, but rather uh, ways of kicking it. So we see a lot of these advertisements um, about how to, to uh, kick morphine in the late 19th, early 20th century as a result of the soldier addiction. It, it, inter more interesting than perhaps the syringes is the lack of, of pipes. Uh, who hasn't watched an old West movie where the, the soldier pulls out a, or a Civil War movie where the soldier pulls out a pipe and starts smoking from a pipe? Well, to make it clear, at Fort Marcy, we found more syringes than pipes. That may or may not reflect the popularity of tobacco in Santa Fe. In fact, most archival talk or discussion about tobacco, consuming tobacco in Santa Fe, is, is focused on smoking cigarettes and cigars. And it was commonly done off the reservation or off the, the military post at these local events known as fandangos. And this is, um, these fandangos, I, you, you'll see this word used a lot. And in fact, it's very romanticized. Um, the Santa Fe Trail is having a meeting uh, this year where they're going to do an old-timey fandango. And I think to myself, God, they, they, they must be... Um, it's, it's good. It's fun. It's a party, right? Yeah. Uh, all those things. Absolutely. Except when you start looking a little deeper at what these fandangos probably actually represent. Um, so it, to the, the public eye, it's a social ball. 
with dan dancing and feasting, and they're held almost nightly in Santa Fe. Um, they provided an opportunity for off, po off post for soldiers to, to consume alcohol, tobacco, and potentially other drugs, as well as meet women. Um, you know, they could dance with women. Um, however, when you start to dive deeper into what people were thinking about these places, um, people along the Santa Fe Trail, such as Joseph Pratt Allen, suggested these things may not be traditional Santa Fe customs. Instead, they seem to be supported by Americans and Americans' wealth. And champagne flowed like water at these events. So this was, this was a way for New Mexico residents to capture uh, some of that U.S. Army money. Um, and, 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 and some people have suggested that perhaps it was a more socially acceptable form of a brothel. Uh, we know of at least one instance in Santa Fe where a soldier paid a woman's husband a fee to keep her company, to dance with her, at least ostensibly to dance with her. But I do want to point out something here. A gentleman uh, taking money uh, in, in payment uh, for, uh, for somebody being able to visit a woman. Um, today, we'd call that a pimp. That's a pimp. So just keep that in mind. Um, so perhaps it's no surprise that given what Sumner, Sumner wrote about the post and, and based upon what we found archaeologically, Fort Marcy was targeted for closure multiple times. Sumner tried in 1851, 1852, um, they actually downsized the post in, 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 in 1867, uh, but it got reactivated in 1875 due to the war with Comanche in the East. Um, they built a Capitol building outside of the military post in 1889. In fact, this is the Baton building in Santa Fe today. So state functions were removed from the post as a way of hopefully, in fact, they were moved across the river uh, to the south side of Santa Fe. Um, but that didn't stop it either. And then in 1891, they transferred military headquarters out to Fort Stanton, which is pretty remote when you, you think about compared to Santa Fe. Fort Stanton's in a much more remote location. And they put the, the whole military reservation up for auction, but the order was rescinded. In fact, it was closed again in 1894. But in the local newspapers, we can still see soldiers regularly drilling and occupying the post. Probably because it was such a, you know, if they could get sent to Santa Fe, it was an easy location for them to, to partake and cut loose a little bit. And it wasn't until 1904 that the, the, the land was gifted to the city of Santa Fe. Most of it was sold at auction, though the remainder was given to the Board of Education and would, would serve as, as, as Santa Fe public schools uh, for quite a while. So what is Fort Marcy's legacy? What can I leave you with here? Um, well, I would say, based upon the archaeological evidence, uh, Sumner's characterization that Fort Marcy and Santa Fe was that sink of vice and extravagance is well-founded. There is clear evidence, both in the archival records and in the archaeological evidence, of corruption and drug abuse. Does this mean everybody who served at Fort Marcy was a drug addict or out to um, take land away from Hispanic people? No, but many were. So I'm going to... Um, Open it up for questions, and yeah, I'm welcome to take any questions you guys have about Fort Marcy. Is Fort Marcy a museum now, or is it still just uh, owned by the city and used for educational purposes? No, it's mostly destroyed. It's not educational at all. Um, in fact, I would bet money that most Santa Fe residents don't even know Fort Marcy even existed. The only thing that kind of exists today is that if you go up on Marcy Hill, you will kind of see the rolling mounds of what represented the star fort on the hill. The rest of it, with the exception of a few small buildings, including, I should say this, the Palace of the Governors is still standing and is a museum, um, but most of the other buildings within the Fort Marcy Military Reservation are gone, including almost all of the officers' quarters, the enlistment's quarters, they're all demoed. In fact, they don't even, their foundations don't exist today because the uh, convention center was built uh, with a basement that goes down several stories so that it's all gone. It's all gone. Um, it exists today in the history books and in the photos and reports that archeologists produced on the, the site. I'll just, I'll just add to that there, the, beside the palace, the only two uh, buildings, uh, both heavily modified, 
uh, that exists from the reservation are the Hewitt House, which is across the street from the entrance to the uh, New Mexico History Museum, and then the, um, the Otero House, um, which is on Griffin Street and is now the educational annex of the, um, of the O'Keefe Museum. And uh, the Otero House is the home of Nina Otero Warren, who you may be familiar with, particularly now because uh, she was one of the great forces for these days, because she's one of the great forces for women's suffrage in New Mexico. Yeah. And those are heavily, heavily modified. Do not expect to go there and view those structures and go, oh, wow, that looks exactly, I'm looking at a part of U.S. history right there. No, you're not. I mean, you are looking at U.S. history, but later U.S. history as opposed to necessarily the, uh, the military post. And I'm one of those people who did not know Fort Marcy existed, even though I'd already lived here for 16 years. Yeah. No. It, it, it's pretty amazing at how many people um, don't know it was there. It, it, it's a very fascinating aspect of um, New Mexico history. Um, now, normally I should present that normally people look at that and go, I served uh, two tours in Vietnam or, or two terms in, in World War II, two tours in World War II or whatever. And, um, you know, your, your portrayal of the U.S. Army is terrible, absolutely terrible. And I always caution to say that, first of all, um, I could talk about a lot of different aspects of the post. I have chosen some of the darker aspects of the post to focus on in this talk. Uh, and I primarily do them because I, I think too many people um, were, were raised on John Wayne movies. And John Wayne is viewed as the, the, the superheroes of the U.S. Army going out and, and fighting uh, violent Native American peoples or, um, the, 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 or, or perhaps it's okay, some people feel it's okay for me to talk negatively about uh, Spanish colonialism. Um, I'm an equal opportunity um, attacker. And while the, the things the Spanish may have done to indigenous populations were terrible, um, the, the Americans were, were no better. Or, um, and, and so regardless of your, 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 your ethnicity or your, your history or relationship to New Mexico, uh, in fact, it should be noted that almost all of this, well, not all, Soldiers, but a substantial number of the soldiers that participated in the campaigns to create um, the, the concentration camp at Bosque Redondo were Californians. So we could just say, oh my God, all Californians are terrible people. They, 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 they developed concentration camps before the Nazis. Uh, well, some of them did, yeah. It's probably not what you hear in the history books, but it's true. Okay, I sent you a question. Um, oh. I, I don't know if this is too far off base, but I was wondering if there was any analysis possible of the fecal matter pulled out of the privies and if there was any difference in the diet or other things relative to that. There, okay. So as I said, there's a million different things I could talk about with this, and I chose one of the bleaker aspects. Another version of this talk that existed long before that sink of vice and extravagance was called Whiskey, Oysters, and Ammo. And it focused on the consumption patterns of the U.S. Army, primarily dealing with diet and the fact that, like, how weird is it they would, they would eat so many damn oysters? And, and, and now we, we found both canned oysters and, and, and actually the shells of, of uh, uh, raw oysters. And, and I remember at the time asking Dee Dee Snow, could they really have gotten these oysters up in the shell into New Mexico and been able to eat them? And she was like, oh, yeah, they pack them in sawdust. But as far as analysis specifically of the fecal matter, yes, there was some done. I would love to say it produced lots of important results, um, but what it, it, it showed that they had a lot of the same bugs that you'd expect them to have. Most of what the study came away with was, was things that were living in the outhouse, uh, the, the post-deposit, as it were, the, the little amoebas and things like that. So that, that's probably more detailed than you wanted. Um, as far as that goes, but they, they had lots, there, there was quite a bit of study done of different consumption patterns and things like that. Um, the, the I, I like to say, I always try to tell myself, it was very early on in my career, and I kind of took the aspect that you should just record everything at that point in my life. So there is, in, in, in the report that was produced for the state, 
Uh, there is huge amounts of info, like as far as timeline, there's like a 30 or 40 page timeline of all the different things I could find in the archival records that mentioned Fort Marcy. And I got billions and billions of newspaper clips. And we looked at the architecture, both the architecture we excavated and the architecture elsewhere and compare it to other military posts uh, around New Mexico and across the country. I mean, some of these studies are very fascinating. Other studies are not that fascinating because one of the things we learned from the study of architecture at Fort Marcy was that the U.S. Army had one way of doing things. They had a plan for how they were going to build um, an enlisted men's quarters. They had a plan for, and, and they rarely deviated from those plans. So a lot of the things that you think would be exciting and they'd have groundbreaking stuff, no, if anything, it just proved that the U.S. Army had a way of doing things, and they followed that way of doing it, whether it was Fort Marcy, Fort Union, or, or any military post in the American West. Um, it, in fact, what you see, the transition in architecture over time, was really the result of different U.S. Army policies through the years, not necessarily um, changes like developments in, in how they thought of things, but whatever the standard U.S. Army policy for building something was at that time. Um, so it's actually amazing how even the outhouses fall within a certain set of parameters that the U.S. Army dictated should it fall under. Um, there, there's other studies that, that um, uh, one of the more interesting things that I was very interested in early on was trying to track, because we're dealing with historic archeology, span I was very interested, um, we, we often get this uh, idea that, uh, you know, in, the, in the, the far west, they didn't have access to the, 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 the best weapons or something like that, but we looked at Fort Marcy. So what I try to do is look at different rounds of ammunition. This is the whiskey, oysters, and ammo version of the talk. You look at different rounds of ammunition and you say, well, the US Army adopted this round in 1873 or whatever. I'm not going to remember the top of my head, but I think the 4570 was 1873 or it was 1871 or something like that. Any rate, so how fast does that become the predominant military cartridge at Fort Marcy? So when, when, when do the other earlier models, so when do, um, for example, the mini balls that were used during the Civil War, when do those go out? Are they just using antiquated weaponry? No. Literally, the U.S. Army would issue a new gun and within as far as the archaeological record was concerned, the next day, obviously that's not true, but in the archaeological record, you can't see days. Sometimes you can only see clusters of years. It looked like the next day, the, the day they issued the new gun, the soldiers at Fort Marcy had the most up-to-date weapon they were supposed to have. So rather than, it's not very exciting at all. They had, they had it right away. Um, there, um, it, it was pretty amazing at how, um, organized the U.S. Army is in most of its practices. So the only place you see this real deviation, this stuff, and I have never found, uh, I, I've certainly read about other posts um, and the consumption of alcohol, perhaps not at this level, uh, but th this was the first time I had found, we had had archeological proof of, of potentially recreational drug use. And so I focused on the, the narratives, and especially in this talk, but also in the narratives of my publishing career on Fort Marcy, on the things that distinguish it from other military posts in the West. And, and those include things such as the, the um, horrendous amounts of alcohol and drug consumption that appears to be present in the post. Oh, uh, Matt, is there a, a, a report that you've written um, or articles or something that helps us understand the, the there, general there is, appearance of- There is absolutely, there are tons of them. Unfortunately, when, when I joke that I have over 400 publications, it's probably fair to imagine that 50 or so of those publications have to do with the U.S. Army of the West. The one that's the easiest to get a hold of that's free of charge, hold on a second, I'm going to jump off the camera and grab it. Okay. So this is the one that was produced free of charge uh, for, by the state of New Mexico. This is called Settlers and Soldiers. The Historic Component at El Pueblo de Santa Fe, LA 1051. This can be downloaded free of charge at the Office of Archaeological Sites uh, website, Archaeology Note 410. Um, I wrote all of the U.S. Army sections of the book, so it's written by myself and Steve Lentz. He writes on the Spanish colonial stuff to some extent, and then I do most of the other uh, chapters in here. So if you want to look at, uh, for example, medicine and, and health-related items, 
across the enlisted men, NCO, and officers' quarters. We've got nice breakdowns and graphs of that kind of stuff. Um, it's got um, – this does not have the painted key in it. So this one's easy to get. The other volume we did on the actual El Pueblo de Santa Fe, you will never see it. I mean, I have a copy, but it's not open to, for open publication. Um, but the um, – you can look at um, – Beautiful, um, if you're interested in tourist trade of Native American pottery, we've got, these are beautiful pots, Native American pots. Yeah, I don't know if you can see them right now. Um, these are not uh, prehistoric associated with the white shell water place. These are tourist wares. In fact, this is a Tsuke flower pot right here that was bought by a soldier that he had at his, his officer's house at Fort Marcy. Um, the, um, what else do we got? And now, mind you, it was very early in my career, but, you know, little dolls' heads associated with kids um, living at the post. Um, dominoes. Soldiers like to play dominoes. I don't know if you can see that on there very good. All sorts of stuff. So this publication is free of charge. In fact, you can go into a billion different directions. I also wrote um, for the Journal of America's Military Past on Fort Marcy. Um, a, a version of this talk was actually published in El Palacio several years ago. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I'm not going to give them all off the top of my head. Um, there's plenty written on Fort Marcy. In fact, all the topics I'm going to talk about on the U.S. Army in the West, which we'll be talking about the Confederate mass grave next, are all published by me. So these are not, uh, these are great talks, but they're, they're supported with a lot more archaeological evidence that I can't give in a talk of, of, of an hour long. I mean, this report is... 422 pages, most of which are dedicated to Fort Marcy. So if you really have a burning desire to show out, go, then, then after that, you can get all the compendium articles and stuff I've written because this was very early. This is actually pre-grad school, Matt Barb. Um, so uh, it, it gets even more dense and, 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 and terrible to read as time goes on, as I get more into the theoretical um, aspects of archaeology and things like that so but if you're interested it's got um lots of tables lots of timelines if you're you're, you're interested in it, it's got a lot of beautiful old maps of the post as well as pictures and it's free that that yeah. one's free oh I, I saw in Medi's question on here at the side i just want to mention as far as uh, oysters go because it's kind of funny thinking about diet and stuff like that the canned oysters were found in the non-commissioned officers' quarters, which kind of makes sense. They get the cans, you know, stay fresh in the cans, kind of, right? You know, you get that lead solder. That's probably not good for you. But the, the live oysters were actually found in the enlisted men's well, which I find hilarious because um, those things had, you know, oysters fresh for, you know, you don't have a lot of ice. I, I, this must have been nasty, nasty, nasty. And they're eating them on the shell. All right, thank you very much. Have a, a, a good evening, and I'll be back with the Confederate mass grave at Glorietta next uh, two weeks from now. Bye, guys. Thanks, Matt.